life. Should I move my beverages? Frame? You can keep two of three. I want, I want all three. I think I realized I've been <laughs> drinking way more drinks. I'm not drinking alcohol this month, dry January. Sure. And my bevy count is through the roof. I'm at like, on average, I'm having probably six different drinks a day. Six different skews of drink. Yeah, skews. Yeah. So, so currently here you have Chief Forish. Which I our guys. always have when we're on the pod. I mean, all the time, but especially on the pod. Water, which is part of my da- daily routine. I, I'm always drinking. I drink water every day, basically. I'm kind of a sicko in that way. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a tweet that was like, when you go real waterheads, go to the cooler Fill up a uh, water, chug it, and then and then refill it, and I do then that. go back. Yeah, I do that. Real water, real water. Yeah, heads. like <laughs> yeah. I've learned recently that I am a real waterhead in a way that, like you, you joked, but there are people who don't drink water. I think actually in New York, drinking less water is almost like a good thing because I mm. am. It is very stressful being out of the home for me. And having to pee. I have to pee all the time. Yeah, same. I've now, I've, I've had to switch from being a window seat person to an aisle seat person because I had four or five cross country flights uh-huh. where sitting in the window, neither person next to me went to the bathroom once in six hours. Yeah. Which I'm taking zero ownership. They have a problem. Correct. That is actually unhealthy. And you, th- you don't think it's okay to ask them to get up? I have and I haven't. I've had times where the plane landed and I thought I was going to die. Mm-hmm. But usually I'm like, oh, wait, oh, wait. At some point they have to get up. It's six hours. And then the flight attendants are like, raise your seat backs. We're- yeah. I'm not nearly as, as polite as you. I, I would ask some. I mean, I rarely sit in the window. Like things have gone wrong if I'm in the window seat or it's a red eye. But I, I don't mind asking them. I was for a very long time climbing over people who were sleeping. And maybe two or three years ago I did that. And there was a flight attendant in the aisle. And she looked at me and I looked and like a little confused. And I was like, am I too old to do that? And she's like, I, I think so. <laughs> she's like, it was, I mean, it was a good move, but yeah. So I stopped doing that. And now so you always wake them up. I mean, if you're sleeping through the night, through the flight, maybe I'd wake you up. But I think I would just be not, I'd be very okay if they're watching a movie or something, just ask them to get up. But oh. sleep, someone who can sl- not, who Sometimes can- they make you get, I've had quite often, they are just like, Feel free to come by. Oh, like scoot scoot your ass across my chest yes. or your nuts across my chin. <laughs> like those are really the only two options. Sometimes it helps it depending on the person's... Anyway, I'm on a... I, I recently flew with a friend and she... I got us both like water bottles this big. I got mm-hmm. myself too. Where do you put it? On the ground. I don't know. Everywhere. I'm, in my bag. I stash one in my bag if I can and I hold the other one. Okay. The, my, my nightmare is running out of water on a flight. Anyway, I got her this bottle. I drank two of them. She drank maybe one quarter of the bottle on the yeah. six-hour flight, and I'm like, this is unhealthy. I always travel with a water bottle. Paying $6 for water at the airport is a bummer. I if you want to carry the metal. No, but it's – oh, well, my backpack has a slot for it. The yeah, only time yeah. I wear a backpack is okay. traveling. Yeah, I'm a still um, messenger guy, even on the plane. And although lately I've been trying to travel with just the carry-on, and there's no water bottle slot, so then I will go carry-on tote, and that's – Okay, that's that combo works, but I bring the water bottle. Ideally, you're in a terminal that has like a Delta Lounge or an Amex Lounge, and you can go fill with nice water, maybe even spa water. Mm. But lately, I don't know, a couple different terminals, the ones that don't have the lounges also don't have the like high, high K, whatever those that like water bottle. You've saved this many plastic water bottles. Yeah, yeah. What is that brand? Shout out those guys. Yeah. Big fan. So the terminals that don't have a lounge also don't have that. So you end up either having to buy, I end up having to either buy a water bottle or doing like the like pathetic water fountain into the, and no that's, way. Disgusting. that's disgusting. But I, I feel like most places have the you've saved filter. I, I, Unclear whether that's filtered. I but. flew, it is, it has the red, yellow, green. It has like, yeah. What is that supposed to mean? Mm. It's been a certain amount of, it's filtered a certain amount of water and through it, and now it's time to change it. But my gym has that, and it's, sometimes it's out of order. But that's a decent segue because I just came from the gym, and I was explaining to maybe the number one mentioned friend on the pod, Brent, that... Wow, he's gaining mentions. He's, he's at three? Yeah. Oh, he's, he's got one anonymous mention. Yep, yep. <laughs> you do the math, detectives. And... and 
he came to the gym and he's like, damn, I should, I should be coming here more off. Like I should have joined this gym. It's, you know, an, an, like an Equinox tier gym. And I realized lately I've been like pitching people on the nice gym thing because now that it's cold, I'm spending more time there mm. and sauna and steam room more often. And I realized the thing that I love about it is that it's like the only real luxury I have. Brent made the point. Okay. So I was saying that you have this ama an amazing luxury in New York city where if you don't, if you aren't intentional about it, you, you sort of just grow to accept that like trash on the street and like the filth of the subway is your reality, but it doesn't have to be. And when you join these nice gyms, you get like pampered and you know, eucalyptus towels and it's like 200, I pay 220 a month, which sounds like a lot, but I go, you know, somewhere between 15 and 25 times. And today that was like a thing I did. I was at the gym for two and a half hours Yeah. and Brent was like, Oh, well, what about going out to a nice meal? That's a luxury we have in New York. Oh, that's a good point. But two meal, two nice meals in New York is more than the the cost per hour spent in meals is radically yeah. worse. Yeah, like not even close. And also, some of the less expensive meals are are still their their arrival. Like I remember, there's this maybe it's Chef's Table Nancy Silverton quote about every, her her a meal at her restaurant costs like three hundred dollars, and she's like, yeah, every single night I'm going up against In and Out. Because for five dollars, or it's probably ten now, for tacos, ten, Los Tacos number one. Yes, for every single night, you have to bring your best because someone could be very satisfied and go to In and Out instead, or yeah. Los Tacos number one or two. I usually am <laughs> number two. You two. you have uh, Los Tacos a lot. Yeah, really. I would say if I'm in the area and I'm remotely hungry, I'm probably getting it. Wow, I get it twice a week. Is it, they're good? Really good. It's the in and out of New York. One thing, one of my like New Better York takes is that we actually have the worst tacos of any major city in America. I haven't had a lot of tacos here, probably by choice. I didn't expect there to be good tacos here. But I, I guess, think Tacombi's decent. No, I I don't. I mean, fine. It's, it's decent. decent. It's decent. Most tacos number one is great. Okay. It is the in and you out of New York. Shrimp or what? No, they don't have shrimp. They have. What's uh, the one in Chelsea Sada. Market? That's Los Tacos, and I got shrimp there. Is it? The one in Chelsea? I think so. I only go to the one on Lafayette. I went to the one in Chelsea Market in like 2019. And I sat down with my friend David. And these people got up. And this woman came over and said, oh, would you mind if we sit here? It was really crowded. And it's like a, a, like a table for four. She said, can, can we sit here? And I was like, yeah, sure. But actually, I have one request. I'm trying to date someone your age. Um, do you have any friends you could introduce me to? She was like a beautiful woman in her 50s. I was 25 or 26 at the time. And I was like, oh, it'd be fun to date someone in their 50s. Like a rich woman to like really take care of me and, you know, show me stuff, buy me stuff. And she looks at me and she goes, I wish my son was as smart as you. And she sat down and we had an amazing meal together. She's a dentist. I went to visit her. She's put her hands inside my mouth. I met her husband. Her her friend who I was with, her friend who she was with that night. So this guy came and met them. So it's her and her husband, and this, this is just, just keeps going. And the, and then their friend, and then we had you know a really nice time together. And the f the friend said, "Oh, I want you to meet my wife. Like I think you guys would really get on well." To you, yeah. And I'm like, great. Like why? And she they said, all want you to meet fifty year old women, multiple. This guy was, no, this guy was probably in his like late, mid to late thirties and he was friends with the older wo middle-aged woman and her husband, they were there. So I became, yeah, and then, so he goes, oh, I, you should meet my wife. Let's exchange contact information. And his wife was the CEO of Philip Lim, which is like a luxury fashion designer. Okay. And then I went to the store and she, she complimented my pants and she's wow. like, oh my God, your pants are amazing. Where are they from? And I said, Lululemon. And she said, Andrew. You're 25 years old. You cannot be wearing Lululemon pants. I'm like, you just complimented them. <laughs> she goes, come to the store. You need to try on some pants. So she pulled out a whole rack of pants for me. I literally didn't fit into one of them. They're all so skinny. They're just, oh gosh. They didn't fit me at all. And then I went to a talk from Basquiat's ex-girlfriend at their store. And I haven't seen them since. So I just said, what? Wait, hold on. Okay, so number one, make more friends with middle-aged women is a lesson. When she said date, what did she mean? The first woman. I said date. 
No, no, no. I thought she said she wanted to date someone your age. I said to her, I want to date someone your age. She's married. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, okay, I was 25 okay, okay, and single, and I, I wanted... Thought, that's why I was like, her husband... What's happening here? Oh, uh, I mean, still kind of, you know... Got it. Eat. Wow, good, good for you. Yeah. And it unlocked anything, I guess... Some dentistry. Fit. She was the dentistry. F- it wasn't free. I had insurance at the time. Dental insurance, I think. It was a great experience, though. I've only ever been to uh, one dentist, my uncle, prior. Oh. So it felt a little like cheating on him, and I texted him before. He's like, "It's okay." I was gonna say, was it weird to have a dentist that you sort of felt like you knew, but that's the only thing you've ever experienced? That's wait. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna let a random person put their the rest of us out here you don't know much, you don't know do. your dentist from outside of <laughs> remember when you used to see, did you ever dentist. run into your teacher your elementary school teachers out in the wild mm, like much year much later no 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 like when you were in elementary school like maybe you see them at the mall i don't remember anything from the, before the age of 10 12 Black. okay fine middle school middle school no really okay because no. that i remember that being like a oh my god she's out of the school she's a real person they let her out yeah but not relatable. So would you, so you would recommend, I guess you didn't, you never really got to actually go on a date with a 50 year old. No. Oh, what was the question? I never did. If that, I don't know what the question was. You brought up the cold weather. I think people to use our friend Dylan's language are seasonally challenged. And he said seasonally affected, which seasonally affected, you didn't sorry. understand. You didn't know that. I didn't Sad know is a thing. thing. Seasonal okay. so affection disorder. So there's some disorder. seasonal affection here. <laughs> Aff- yeah, seasonal affection. There's seasonal affection. I'm admiring. You've spent what? I'm admiring the seasons. The okay, seasonal that's what I'm doing. So as someone, I think for those out there who are bummed out about the weather, mm-hmm. you've spent both of the last two winters outside of New York. Three, warm. Th- three went t- uh, twenty one two three. I've spent the last four winters out of New York. I've never lived in a cold place in my life. This is my very first time okay. in any context. So uh-huh. I thought we would be well equipped to talk to people about how to deal with their seasonal affectation. Affectation. Well, we know that there's one route that you've taken, which is retail therapy. I have bought two. I bought a puffer and I bought a very large coat. Your MSRP on how to counter the winter is two thousand dollars no 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 my guess no it's probably less than a thousand dollars combined for the no two. that's what you spent oh i got some deals <laughs> yeah yes, you got yeah, deals. that's true i uh, probably 1500 msrp but i got a, a big 40 percent off on the puffer and the big coat i felt like i got the puffer recently which was very necessary in time but the big coat like the make sure no none of these thigh length coats like below the knees felt like a rite of passage. It felt like I live in a cold place now. I'm a New Yorker, or I'm at least I'm a, at the beginning phases of being a New Yorker. And I'm in that thing. It's swaddling me like shins to sometimes up to here. How do you feel when you sit on the subway with it on? I don't mind. Yeah, I did have a brief thing where I was like, how, how do I feel about subway? Like, is this a foot on shoes on the bed or like outside pants on the bed yeah. situation? But I'm, I'm over it. Uh, I don't think about it. The puffer is sort of like what what happened with comfy clothes in the last. I think we're we're swinging back from comfy clothes. I'm out on comfy clothes minus the puffer. The the puffer is not necessarily comfy clothes, but it's like when you're going to decide between wearing the big wool coat or the puffer every time you just pick the puffer because it's the easy option. Yeah, like- especially at night or it, really what it is is if I'm going to take this off and. There's probably not coat check. How much of a pain is it going to be to like drape this over something? I've been out two weeks in a row where the coat check ran out of space. Oh my gosh. Last night, people were bidding in the, I was leaving and they're like, are you leaving? And I was like, are you paparazzi? Like they were just like paparazzi type energy. And I'm like, yes. And like, do you have a coat? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, please, please. Like, That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I don't like that. Well, back to the underlying premise. I think as someone who is new, maybe, maybe knock on wood. I'm, this is just new. Like I'm going to get, it's going to be mid February and I'm going to be dying from the cold. I'm not going to speak to anyone who lives in an actually cold place like Chicago. It's the coldest day we've had. It was 18 degrees. It's been mostly 25. And to me, it sort of feels like this is like, I'm so excited for spring when that comes, it's going to be so much better. 
And for now, if you have gloves and you have a puffer, maybe if you're run cold, you need those Uniqlo leggings. Mm-hmm. It's it's not an issue. I don't have um, leggings, and I was thinking about getting the Uniqlo ones, but I think I want something wool. Mm. Um, the leggings are pretty warm. Like I wore those. It's on not the- a. It's not a. It's more like a artificial fibers thing. Like I don't necessarily no want. Plastics. I don't want like the plastics. You know, keeping my balls warm. Well, you wear them over underwear. What? You don't. <laughs> I. Wow, that is an interesting poll. If people wear underwear under long underwear, do you know the phrase "longs and longs"? No, I know long underwear. Yeah, I, the longs only- and longs is wearing like long underwear. Like you have your long. Your long okay. shirt and your long. So my only experience of this in my entire life until a month ago was skiing. Yeah, I knew the term. Me too. I've, ne- long- I, I've I've lived here for uh, five six years, and I've never worn long underwear. We also haven't had a real winter since twenty seventeen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the first snow on the ground this week. Two two different days. I was very happy. Um, in two and a half years, I think first actual like persistent snow on the ground for you or no, no. or in the city in the city. What do you think you're going to do to, to not uh, be seasonally affected? I think people, this is really easy for me to say as someone who's lived in a 70 degree. You don't have degree, to qualify it. People let the weather affect their mood way too much. Ooh. This past spring, it rained in LA for like the first three months of the year a lot. Granted, I was traveling a good amount. I was in San Francisco a lot though too. It rains. We desperately need the rain. We live in a desert. And people, it is the only thing half the people I know talked about for three months straight. About how... I think it's like an attack on their identity, though. Like, part of the reason why people, like, the thing that people identify with about living in L.A. is the weather. Sure, but everyone who lives anywhere or talking about it living anywhere, it's always like, how could you live in Seattle? The rain. How could yeah, you live yeah. in New York? You got to get out of New York. The one thing I'll, 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 I agree on is that New York and other places like it in July is really brutal for me. And yep. I like the, the humidity. hot and humid is the worst combo by far the worst. And I run, you realize that people run cold, but like wear some warm, it's three months. It's hard to get a fit off in the humidity. There's this story from this guy, Josh Waitzkin. It is. Yeah, it's really, that's the other thing that's cool about the cold. Yeah. You can be drippy. bro. I sent you the photo of that guy on the train yesterday. So but. he had this like sweater. He had the knotted sweater over his, his layers were amazing. I, I, yeah, he, he was he was dressed well. And bra- good browns and blues, long coat. Layering is not a thing in California. Oh, no, I mean, of course not. He, in San Francisco, they layer with a pat. You go, wear a, a t-shirt, and then you wear a vest. A, no layering. You'd wear like a patago- You'd wear like a sweater, and then a Patagonia puffer, and and zip and sweater. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, Josh doesn't live in New York anymore. I don't think, but when he did, he was ra- talking about raising his son. And he wanted to teach him um, a sort of like an internal locus of control mm-hmm. rather than an external one. So most people, when it rains outside or there's bad weather, it's like, oh, we can't do what we wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So what he taught him is that anytime it rained, and he, he basically, would, I think he said, like, we would never miss a storm. They would go out and they would play. And he taught him to say, it's so good. Wow. And I love that mentality. And again, I don't, different people run cold. The broader mentality of like, the weather is going to change my entire week or month yeah. or day seems a little silly to me. Do you ever start calls? I mean, you and I are not on a lot of calls these days, but it's, it's weather. you know, people default to weather. Mm. It's sort of, yeah, I do that too. What, what is the solution? Like, how do you, how do you cold open a call? How do you, well, this, this reminds me of that essay that we both read, I think earlier this year by Andrew Cortina about it. Uh, how do you respond to like, how you doing? Just, uh-huh. just Living another day in paradise. Yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And the problem is there are cliches like that, that I think people are like, like, if you said that live in the dream, like I'm going to walk away. Uh-huh. I liked just another day in paradise. Cause there's a sarcastic reading of it and an sarcastic reading of it. And I think they almost can, can come together. The weather thing is the, we've talked about this idea of a cash response, maybe. Have I told mm-hmm. you about this? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I feel, I think My about book club lot. gave me a lot of, they, they, they liked when I used that. Really? Because we were talking about morning pages and I, I was saying, how mm-hmm. do you have to work past the cash? Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, cash, that's genius. Yeah, yeah, I didn't yeah. credit you. Computer though. term based, that, I don't need the credit. I'll get the credit right here. Yeah. Uh, the computer term for cash, the idea that there's sort of this safe state of memory that's, that's really fresh and doesn't need to be, um, you don't have to like dig for it. And so, so much of what we say, many of my takes, including literally what I'm doing right now, because I've said this before, is cached. I'm going to say a version of it, which is that we, 
Um, I have a take on XYZ, on self-driving cars. Or, I, or a, a really essential version of this is every call, you're saying the same thing you've probably been saying all week about the weather or whatever. And I think the weather is the worst one. It is, I wonder if it's a question. I wonder if it's a, I mean, if you just started saying something earnest, even if it was cash for the week, you're like this week I'm going to lead my calls with, I've been feeling really grateful about my friends lately. Like, how would people respond? I don't know. There, some people, um, I, I learned this uh, from a friend, was saying that in, in Farsi, there is a word for empty gesture, but it doesn't have connotations. Yes. And it, it just is a thing that you do. And it, that doesn't necessarily, like, that doesn't mean that it, because you do the thing that other people do. Just Repetition as, doesn't spoil the prayer. Sure. Yeah. You can get kind of like on your high horse about talking about the weather. People might be, people might, most people would probably appreciate if you opened up with like some gratitude. To Yeah. There's, there's a couple of goals here. One, I just don't want to spend the next two minutes of every beginning of every inter mm -hmm. social interaction. Both of us hate it. Two, it would be really cool to be able to have a, a positive impact on people and just like, Maybe it's better at the end of the call, but it would be awesome to have people leave an interaction with me feeling more grateful. Yeah. Again, it's a little, little high horse territory, but much more interesting than talking about how we got to get out of New York for February before. I'm leaving New York for February. You are leaving. New York. How do you feel? I don't feel ready to leave. I've been enjoying, I, I've skipped the last four winters and now I don't know if this one will, I guess that leaving fe for February and March. That feels like skipping the winter. Okay. Um, think of, we talked about this. December's great. Yeah. Season, and then January, like, everybody just got back. We got a little snow. I'm not, it feels too long to leave, but I'm excited about it. I was going to do a little bit of traveling. I think I'm going to go home and stay. A friend of mine has an extra bedroom in South Florida. My grandmother and her boyfriend share a car. Shout cool. out Artie. Shout out Nanny Ike. Uh, they share a car, but Artie has a Honda Accord with the, Korea veteran hat in the rear view. Um, you know this this move? No. So you know the 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 war veteran hats. Yeah. He's got one, and that's like a pretty common place. You put it in the back in the back of the back it's seat. It's the same facing. idea as a bumper sticker. Sort of, yeah. Okay. But you can wear it. I don't you can wear, wear it. A bumper sticker. I don't wear it. I also may or may not use his handicap. Uh, I think if it's in pass. the car and you're related to them, you're totally clear. My dad actually told an amazing story. Uh, we, I was in North Carolina for New Year's, and it was me and my parents and an, another yeah. couple. And I was asking them about the first concerts they had been to because I put on a song, and the guy who was driving was like, oh, wow, I used to listen to this song in my convertible in high school. My nerdy friend and I thought we were the, like, the coolest people in the world. We just so cool. blast this. And, so cool. Oh, what was your first concert? And we got to talking. And then I reminded my I wanted my dad to tell this story about how the night he got his license he got a speeding ticket the night he got his license he went to a concert he drove himself to a concert wow. and on the way there got a speeding ticket and on the way back got another speeding ticket no way <laughs> yes and when I was they, have, they didn't have learner, learner's permits back then yeah sure they did he oh just was really eager maybe they didn't how do you get two speeding tickets you go time. fast. You go really fast. And like, oh. Why else get a license? Yeah, and uh, but he thought I was prompting him to tell a different story that I didn't know, which was he had gotten pulled over a different time, and the cop said something to him, and he said, oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. And the cop thought he said, sorry, I'm deaf, I can't hear. So the cop started talking really slowly and using his, So my dad's like, fuck it and pretended to be deaf back to the cop and didn't get a ticket <laughs> he was like oh shit this guy thinks i'm deaf like and then just you could probably go to jail like you're going to jail if you screw that up no really yeah i don't know what the crime would be but he would be so pissed i donated high to, risk high reward i donated to a friend a friend is uh very involved with an organization i won't name the organization but it's like a you know, Susan G. Komen is like the breast cancer one. That one's actually a scam. It's a non-profit. It's a non-profit for research and to help people with a specific condition. Okay. Um, and I donated one year for his birthday. 
and they gave me like a membership, like a thanks for being a donor. And included in the package was like an excuse card for people that have people that have this condition have to go to the bathroom more often than most. And it came with a card, both in like the regular credit card size and the like mini library card size that said, please, uh, let me go. I, I have to let you know I've got to go. And then the other side, it says, I have a condition that requires me to use the bathroom more often than most. And I guess for it's, driving, for it's speeding, for speeding, like, it, hey, if you're having an, in, which There's is like, no way they can give those out to donors, to donors. I it's would, like when you, when you, I gotta, I gotta, this I, I have, I have it in my, I'll send you a picture of it. Later. Yeah. We, we're not, we're not going to post them. Cause it's like, we don't want this going on TikTok. We don't want it everyone yes. else to know, but okay. So you're going back to Florida for February. Oh, and I'm going to stay at David's. He's got an extra bedroom. Second, I'll, he's catching up on Brent quick. Two mentions of this podcast. Different David. I've got multiple Davids. And this actually is the David, I know second David's no, no David. I know lives in New York. It's a different David. And my dad's David too. Um, really makes you think. Gal- so each David has one mention? So far, yes. Three, okay. So David has the apartment. I'm going to stay at his place, and I'm going to work a lot, I think. That's the goal. And you're just going to be in Florida all, Beb? I have a wedding, uh, an Utah LK and weekend, Utah. and then we're going skiing in Utah, you and me, uh, and, and a couple others. That's going to be really exciting. A new mountain. I haven't skied a new mountain since 2017. Do you watch it? Do you watch any podcasts? Watch any. I listen to a lot. I don't really watch. Um, when you record for video, I, I noticed myself doing this even already today, and I'm sure we had it in the last one where I was starting to put in those images, but I I was reacting without sound to one of your stories, and I realized after like a listening, that's not going to be as good. Mm-hmm. So I think when you have the camera on, you are consciously or unconsciously making the viewing experience better with a camera. Yeah. I watch a lot of YouTube, but I'm just not going to watch an hour long. Yeah. And, and the best talk show YouTube stuff is more like Chicken Shop Date or your guy, Adam Friedland. And it's more of like a 15, 20 minute sit down, heavily cut. I'm curious how people respond to ours though, because we're going to try to do some clips. And then also this last episode, if it wasn't obvious to people, I edited heavily. I spent a lot of time editing. Someone, someone complimented that to you, right? They said they liked the they clips. They said they felt like it was snappier. Yeah. Um, but it was still, it was, it was obviously it was six hours of content. And that was the we, worst. I'm right. It was the worst it hour. It was the worst 20%. Of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't that much. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm curious to explore. We've also talked about maybe just doing audio. So far with our very small sample size, more people are watching on YouTube than Spotify. Actually, that's not true. Sorry. Thousands are watching, listening on Spotify. <laughs> on How Long Gone? They interviewed Stavros. I don't know how to say his last name. He was one third of a podcast called Come Town. Yeah. Come, he left Come Town to uh, do his own thing. That became the Adam Friedland Show. And the they do audio only on uh, How Long Gone. Video, Stavros on his podcast does video. And Jason was saying on How Long Gone, like he basically doesn't want to have conversations anymore. Like, if it's not being recorded or you don't pay him because it's ruined. Like he's having, he's like, I'm having high quality conversations when we record them. And Stavros said that happened on their thing. But now like, with the one dynamic they like about the video is like, it's a, it is a different thing than having a conversation. And, mm. and that made it, dif- that made it separate from just doing like a, an audio recorded thing. Yeah. I just, I'm not sure that people, that many people are sitting down to watch an hour of a conversation, which is why a podcast is so great. And even by the way, even the visual podcasts, I'm usually, I have the YouTube feature where you can close your phone. Premium. Premium. And uh, I'm listening to it most what are, of the time. What are your, what's your subscription stack? Oh, gosh. Do you have an app that you can pull it up? Copilot? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's not pretty. It's I'm spending far, far, far too much money. I mean, I'm spending money now on Descript and Adobe Premiere. I, f- I went to go cancel Adobe Premiere because I used Descript this most recent time and I liked it. And then I found out that somehow I had tried to cancel previously and they gave me a deal, but that deal was at the annual rate. And they said, if I cancel, they're going to charge me $100. Stupid. Anyway, so I'm paying... You got to get that Figma billion somehow. I'm paying $40. <laughs> I'm paying $40 a month or more. 50 for podcast editing software. Amazing. Got to gotta solve that problem. Let's see. What are our other recurrings? Google Suite. For what? It's like Google Drive, Google Photos, okay. 
um, Stratechery. Yep. Oh, man. I'm going to get canceled for um, how much crap I'm spending money on. Obsidian. You said crap twice on the last podcast. I think we're cutting worse. That's your one is your max on this one. Okay. Sorry. Um, no, don't apologize. It, what else? It is crap. Nope. Obsidian. What's that? Three. Obsidian is a note taking app. I pay them for sync and I pay them because I started hosting my website there. I like okay. them a lot. I'm happy to support. Okay. Um, that, you, I assume you feel similarly about Stratechery. Yeah. Stratechery, I don't read as consistently as it would be worth it, but every time I read or listen, and I've re- actually really enjoyed his podcast. So I listened to the dithering one with John Gruber and I listened to 60% of his daily updates. Mm-hmm. I don't listen to some of his other stuff, but it makes me smarter. YouTube premium. That's the, that one's worth it. It's the best one. What do you pay for that? Ten dollars. I pay seventeen. Then do the family. And the uh, have I I told you about? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Have I told other people? Everyone on the podcast. We should set up a a, um, a, basically what you do is you can get up to five heads on on YouTube Premium. You split it. I don't split it. I gift it. Oh, you gift it. I've gifted it to four friends. What we should do is create a Google Doc or an Excel sheet where everyone listening on the podcast can jump into family plans, and then we take a rake. And this is how we pay for my my podcast editing software. I pay for Clay, which is a contact app. Um, that is or is not the one that Yash works at. Different company. Uh, it's like a CRM, but it's the only way I can make sense of. It, remember when everyone was tweeting every day, every third day, like we need a personal CRM. Yep. Clay is built. I don't love it, but it's good. I would recommend it. I I have some. Criticism. What does it give you? Like context about the people? main thing I use is search. It allows you to just pull in all of the different apps. LinkedIn, everything, mm-hmm. email sync, everything. And it, it's like um, Clearbit, but for personal? Sort of. hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, they're trying to move into to business and that sales. That sense, because you pay them how much? I pay them too much. I think it's $20. A month? Yeah. That you're not using that? No, I use it every day, but I'm not... Every day? No, 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 sorry. Does it have a feed? Yeah. That's no, like... I, I didn't pay for years, because I was like an early adopter. So it's that's pretty expensive. I don't... But it's... Yeah, it's like... It's, that's a lot. It's better than Superhuman. Like I get more value out of it than I would get from like one of those email apps. They ha- they barely have that. I, the they have a is, photo. Superhuman has a photo of me from like 2017. I'm too used to Clay to quit it. I think. Okay. Um, also, I used to meet so many people. It was really useful for for that. Right. You going into a meeting, you could find you need yeah. you get an assistant, a virtual assistant, to do some research for you for that price. Probably a lot of these things. Probably. I mean, I'm not even done. A couple of dating apps insurance another google cloud storage I'm, I'm paying oh no one is google suite yeah that's what i asked about suite you I have do you have a is. domain that you a, host on google I with must. your e- email at jacksondahl.com i or don't something? use that though i have adobe sales iphone uh crisp technologies which is the it's five dollars it's the ai zoom thing it cuts out the background yeah, noise it's good but zooms. i don't need that for five dollars anymore yeah Audible, but that's covered by a credit card. Twitter. You don't need Audible anymore in general because Spotify. I also don't use it. Yeah. But that one's free. Twitter, gym. Twitter, I... Oh, really... I'm paying for Twitter now, but it's been 30 hours since I paid for it. You Yesterday, you, you shared the... It's a scam. This pod. And, and I figured, okay, like if we're going to do this maybe for $8 a month, because it's trying to reach your subscription amounts, I can... I'll, it'll, I'll, we'll get in front of more eyeballs. And you, I actually found out you can hide the blue check mark, which I'm pretty excited about. I can ha- oh, have it and maybe I should not that. have people know that I have it. Long um, story short, I have a couple of newsletters. I subscribe to Blackbird's Biplane and I subscribe to my friend Ava. And you, so, you pledged $8 to Just a Thought. So I don't know. It's not you, in there. You but. can turn it on. Long. St- <laughs> I, I think if you take out insurance and rent, I'm paying about a hundred dollars a month across these things a little bit more it's really not that crazy but it just but that's not including the gym and my iphone and insurance and rent and soho house it's stupid there's a lot this this stuff adds up but the, that's my point though is like does a hundred dollars really like a hundred dollars in subscriptions you're going to cut out like a five dollar all of on? the time i just spent thinking about that i could spend on trying to actually make money and it would be more efficient i think then cut then can't, oh, I mean, clearly canceling, canceling them $5. is not that easy. Yeah. Lock. Paying $50 a month for two different podcast video editing apps for our 85 viewers. I'm not sure that needs to happen. That's that's 85 on, on YouTube. 
Oh, but that's that's where the viewership's happening. Although there's like there are a lot of impressions. We have a lot of impressions on. We our our ratio of text to the hosts per view is top podcast in the world. Hmm. I would suspect this week. Pro- that's probably true. We probably got combined twenty texts, twenty individual messages. Yeah. Out of eighty-five viewers on YouTube at the time of this recording, granted, not yesterday. Five thousand people have seen the tweet. But not a, the tweet, which contains the entire podcast. We How many people do you think listen to the entire podcast through? Through? Yeah. 75% or more. Se- I think 75 people. Dude, it has 85 views on YouTube. But who's going to YouTube? It's happening on Twitter. Your audience is on Twitter. A lot of people... I, I t- Multiple people who sent me notes sent me notes with screenshots from their Spotify. Spotify has like 40 views. Listens. Yeah. What do they count as a listen? I don't know. Let's see what Twitter has. We're really not selling ourselves. Um, oh, these people are early. Oh, actually, true. you know what? Speaking of selling ourselves, I want to interview. I want to do uh, for us to do our first interview okay. with, and I think it should be Kyle Chaka. Okay, I uh, want to talk about that today. I think the interview. You you think we need a bigger audience? Yes. I think seventy five people <laughs> listened to our last episode. I think we have a compelling enough pitch to get somebody to take a a twenty minute chance of being our first guest, and they'll you know someone like Kyle ideally, who understands we we are fighting against the algorithm. This is an this is a, a podcast that fights against the algorithm. Wow, we are giving you hand curated, literally by hand, bare hands yes. in broad daylight, and we're paying eight dollars a month each to Twitter. X. And to Descript and to Adobe and no, to my but, Google but Suite. The eight, the eight we're spending is to to overpower the algorithm with our non-algorithmic recommendations. Are we overpowering or are we feeding you on to do exactly what Kyle's against? Kyle Chaka for context. I think if unless people are um, sophisticated, amazing anti-algorithmic taste seekers and read my newsletter and or your newsletter, because I'm sure you've recommended it. I mentioned in the Kyle past. many times. Yeah. Kyle is an excellent writer. He just wrote this book called Filter World. Filter World. Filter World. You have a copy here. No, I lied. I said I picked it up in my newsletter. It's waiting at McNally Jackson. So yes, so is mine. Uh, we can go after this. That's a great idea. Um, and he's brilliant. Ezra Klein, who I also think is brilliant, particularly as a engaged interviewer. They had a really cool conversation about the book, and and really the essence of it is, I think, something that you and I are clearly both interested in, which is. That, how do you put in time and energy to finding the things in a sea of infinite content that is actually resonant with you and your taste? Not just the thing that sort of like lands on your doorstep is the minimum viable, seemingly enjoyable thing. Because mm-hmm. that's pretty. it's never been a better time in history for that. It turns out I could probably go on Netflix and turn on whatever they show me and have an okay time. Um, but... One of the reasons I think both of us do the newsletter, part of what was inspiration for the beginning of this podcast and, and where our conversation has gone is that like it's worth seeking out the stuff that isn't just resting on the surface. It relates yeah. to the cash idea. It's like the, the floor of of enjoyment uh, or a content, culture. The floor has been lifted. It's actually a lot like the, the lifespan stuff where like the lifespan, mm. our lifespans have increased but only because we've gotten better at like treating infant mortality, but we haven't gotten better at end of life care. You haven't raised the ceiling. Correct. Yeah. And it, that's that's sort of what it what. Uh, you, there was something you mentioned in the or you highlighted in your newsletter. I haven't listened to the the interview yet. Um, talking about how it, just a lot of these algorithms reward mediocrity. Totally. Uh, and you and I have talked about that with with yeah, movies. Yeah. The middle. Well, it's related to the Rotten Tomatoes idea. Yes. When you quantify. When you, when you gamify something and, and use points to quantify it in a way that's super legible, um, with, in the most scalable way, Kyle even mentions that on the podcast, he's, he's, media and things have never been more scalable, you get to middle outcomes, which is the types of movie that do best on Rotten Tomatoes, the types of content that do best on most, algor- most algorithms. Kyle gives the example on the podcast of like a Marvel movie. A Marvel movie is great for the, a really wide audience because if you're super hardcore and you love Marvel and you want to go down all the rabbit holes, you can. Or you're going to be like, whether you're left or right side of the bell curve, you can be like, cool, explosions. Yeah. Um, which I don't, I, don't, I don't knock that at all. I, I actually think it's awesome that type of content exists. I, I knock it a little bit. But there's a lot. I think Avengers Endgame is like, in some ways, was the peak of this. 
And now it's been the market trying to like return to find something like that again. And it turns out when you're making um, duplicates of duplicates of the made to perfectly fit the pop culture machine, it just feels flattened and empty. And that's where it sort of, uncoincidentally, by the way, not to make this totally about mainstream pop culture and film, but like Disney had their, probably their worst year ever this past year. What was their, what was their big movie? Uh, well, one, it was the first time, uh, at least at the Golden Globes, neither Disney nor Pixar won in like forever. What won? Uh, Miyazaki, The Boy and the Heron. Huh. And we saw that together. We did. I really liked it. Um, and they just didn't do well, very well box office. They, they did Wish and they had some long way to I actually like, haven't even heard of Wish. I think it's like a Frozen type thing. And then they, there was a Pixar Elemental. Oh, didn't they do something too? Or that's Inside Out 2 is coming out next that's year? That's coming out next year. Okay. You, you, the core point being that there is a tendency towards the middle. And ultimately, I think especially, I'm super excited to, to read about Kyle's take on this because he's written a bit about it in the past and alludes to it in the podcast, is that the internet actually is so good at helping you find weird niche. Mm-hmm. But the mainstream kind of internet that most people are using today seems to be pushing people towards just the minimum viable middle thing that will be entertaining to everybody. And I don't think it's fair to do a blank statement on that. I think a platform like TikTok is actually fairly good at helping you find weird, interesting stuff. But the coolest stuff on the internet is often like, wow, I found a thing that there's only 10,000 of us or 100,000 even who really love this, but we love it. Um, I was talking about Reddit last night at dinner and someone asked me like, oh, you know, I feel like he was like, oh, I don't think like a lot, people don't really use Reddit. And I was like, a lot of people use Reddit. But then we looked around the table and even the restaurant. I was like, it's hard to imagine that anybody here, or at least in like, I mean, of our friends, I don't think a lot of people are like daily Reddit users. I think a, I think a decent amount are. The, the other thing this reminds me, though, is that you and I recently or sometime over the summer realized that a ton of people we didn't we we know don't watch YouTube. It's mind blowing to me. And that one's even crazier to me than Reddit. But it is interesting to me that we would even position something like Instagram as so much quote unquote worse in this dimension than Reddit. But I think there's something about the medium of Reddit, which is Reddit is a platform that even though the incentives of Reddit have been to push more people towards the biggest subreddits in the homepage, the nature of the platform itself is similar to Discord and at least how Twitter used to be, is that it wants you to fall into silos. And Instagram, there's none of that articulated. We, we've talked a little bit about Reels. Our parents' age people are certainly addicted to Reels. Totally addicted to Reels. Um, and Reels feels like maybe the most extreme example of what Kyle is getting at around this like mid type of content. Mm. I'm not trying to high horse, but I even compared to TikTok, like I, I and, and it's a little bit of an age demographic thing, but I really think if you just compare the average TikTok video and the average Reels video, by all accounts, they should basically be the same. Does is Reels uh, algorithmic in the way like can you you know like people hang out in specific areas of TikTok that they either consciously or not so consciously end up in, and then they they're, they're hanging out there and they're watching a lot of like plumbing videos or or like. Um, I was talking about this with Adam, uh, who runs like TikTok and Reels production studio, but really TikTok. And I was asking him about this. If I'm if I'm re- remembering correctly, I think his view was that obviously part of it's just demographic, and the other part of it is that a huge amount of Reels growth is share based in a way that's much less the case for TikTok. So Adam would say that there's not really like a social graph in TikTok, right? There's like a following. There is, but yes, he would say like Instagram, you're showing up ultimately for your friends, messages, stories really, but maybe feed and you end up in reels. And thus there's a lot of watch a reel, send a friend, send a mom, send a buddies. And on TikTok, it's the other way. You're going to be entertained. And then maybe you have some friends on there. And that would explain perhaps why Reels trends tends more towards us all kind of looking at the same things. And TikTok, if you're sharing something, you're more likely to be sharing highly memeable, widely viewable. That's my impression, but I've never seen a reel as far as I know. Really? I, I don't have... Oh, because you don't even have Instagram on your phone. Yeah. I think TikTok and YouTube feel more similar. And it's because I send a lot of YouTube videos, 
and occasionally TikTok videos, but I'm mainly doing it on my own. It's more, mainly single player. And then I can occasionally wrap it around. Most reels I see, almost every reel I see, unless it comes up in the feed, is shared with me. Reels feel more like memes. So lots of sports meme reel. It's it's almost like reels and twi- tweets have become similar. They're are, often shared. Are reels with me. like what what like Barstool and House of Highlights were? Like that's just what I imagine reels. They have turned most Instagram videos into reels. Yes. Huh. But there is also a specific. So is reels just Instagram videos that are, have an algorithmic sh- like shareability. But they focused it on being way more vertical video, full screen vertical video. Okay. Yeah. So that's really the. Only- There's a tab in Instagram now that is TikTok, and it's reels. Okay. But they've also put all the other Instagram videos into Reels. And you don't think Kyle would enjoy talking about this with us? <laughs> I don't even understand what an Instagram Reel is. I think he would... For what it's worth, I'm, he didn't... At least in that podcast, they didn't talk about Reels explicitly, I don't think. But I do think he would agree with our take on Reels. And I think the other thing he would say is that Twitter especially has gone from a place that used to reward taste. Twitter might be the, the most explicit articulation of one of his points, which is that we used to live in this version of the internet, maybe even Ezra makes this point at the beginning of the podcast, where you would, you would craft, or excuse me, you would curate curators for yourself. You would build up a list of people who you trusted to share ideas, retweet things, links, etc. And as Twitter has become more, more algorithmic, a few things have happened. One, you can't rely on the people who have followed you to see your things. I've certainly experienced this. And two, because everything is so much more algorithmic, the Twitter feed looking less like Twitter used to be and more like TikTok or Instagram Reels, everyone is incentivized to just do the most widely appealing take. Like the Thread Boys. Because it won't show, it won't even show up to your followers unless it hits. Right. And, and Ezra made this point. I, it used to be the best thing about Twitter is that I would follow people specifically because they had alternative or contrarian or unique takes. And those would get less likes, but I would still see them because I followed them. Yeah. And now I'm not getting them at all. It does. Feel, I have to go to their individual we're, we're, feed. It does feel a little like, I don't know if it's Twitter that's the the at fault here, or just that sounds a lot like where the world has gone. So I think two things can be true. I think clearly this is the minimum viable best way to succeed on the internet. A platform that leans into appealing to as many people with low, cheap dopamine will always crush. Think about a, the, the extreme other end of the barbell, like Arena or Cosmos, mm-hmm. these types of products, will never be big. Arena is fundamentally non-algorithmic. I was talking about this with someone recently, which means that the taste on Arena, if you're willing to do the work, is mind-blowing. This is A-R-E dot N-A for those not familiar. But even Arena for me is like a little like heart. I, I was more of a Twitter person. Separately, I think Elon is clearly desperate for Twitter to maximize engagement and look as much like TikTok as possible. And as a result, um, and by the way, can anyone blame him? He bought it, didn't really end up wanting to buy it, and now he's desperate to try to figure out how to make it make you money. You think there's any any legs to the idea of it being the everything app? Like the the WeChat? Is that the... that's the Absolutely not. I think TikTok has a chance to be an everything app. And really? Twitter's just trying to be TikTok. Yes. And really the everything app... I'm still using Snapcash as my primary way to. <laughs> Thank goodness. I it's it's mostly I communicate in Bitmojis. Yep. I pay in Bitmojis Snap- and Bits coins. I pay in Snapcash. <laughs> Twitter the the death of Twitter thing has bummed me out, but I've tweeted and talked. I, I didn't so do a great it. job last night of uh, explaining to people why I was upset about the state of Twitter. Uh, one person thought that people are upset because Elon's controversial, and he was like you guys are pussies like that's not a real reason to not like twitter and i was like fair that's that is not a real reason and then i was like well the the product has gotten worse which i think is true and that's sort of what we've just been talking about but now the product has gotten a little bit better but better in terms of more reliable but it's definitely different as in it works it was not working for a long time it still doesn't really work on the web the web i i I I mean i only use it in the on my computer in the web yeah that's what i mean sorry mobile web and app i've deleted okay and the computer web frequently won't load search doesn't work it's like actually buggy okay the bigger thing i think that's impossible and in um if if people are actually really curious the best thing on this topic that anyone's written is uh eugene way wrote one on like uh how to blow up a timeline i've had that saved and with all of eugene's pieces i yeah 
I, I don't have I have too much free time to read. Them. We need to podcast about them. <laughs> in any case, what he articulates so well and what is so hard and why there isn't a solution here is that ultimately there was a small group of people, small relatively, who got to use Twitter down to two. Got to use Andrew for this is the this is the visual thing. Andrew just finished his chi water and put it down on the ground. Now now we're having text narration. Anyway, uh, Twitter was for a small group of different communities, um, technology, gaming, journalism, and then a handful of other online communities, was this weird place on the internet that wasn't actually, it was sort of explicitly niche for a long time, probably from 2010, 9, 10 to 2018. And people like you and I, we met on Twitter. I've met so many of the people who are close to me in my life. I've gotten job opportunities, all this stuff from Twitter, but people for years would ask like, I don't understand, how you wh what it is, how you use it. It was a very manual process. In some ways, it's actually a great instance of what Kyle talks about, where you have to do the work to find the people who are like-minded and, and so on and so forth. And as a result of that, Twitter was, Ben Thompson's also talked about this, Twitter was never a good business because good internet businesses are really good at showing tons of people ads that convert. And there are a lot of parts about the nature of that product that made it that way. Elon has... I can't say he's made the product worse because for the average person in the world who might ever try Twitter, Twitter is probably more default engaging now than it has ever been. But for its power users, really meaning for the people who use Twitter more like a social network and not like a media feed, it's far worse. And that is the dilemma is I can't even, it, they might be making more money now. I don't know. And that's, I, I know for sure they're not. Okay. Yeah, I, I look, I've been very critical of what Elon has done, but I also can't, they tried to, for the entire time I used it, and when you worked there and for a long period of time, Twitter was in this limbo state where there was whatever, let's say 10 million people in the world who it, it was their favorite thing and everyone else was like, I don't get it. I, I don't know how that gets fixed though. I don't know what the structural need, maybe it's just the pendulum. Right, it's, it's hard to just to be upset about the macro conditions and it's easy to be, it's, nobody wants to be like, uh, talked down to for their, their, ha, like for just being a product of the algorithm. We and have been doing that for most of this podcast in multiple. Nobody wants to, we're going to do it. I mean, nobody wants that. And also hopefully at least our first, you know, hundred listeners are probably like people who are decidedly non-algorithmic in their consumption because this isn't they have found this, us. <laughs> yes. Wow. Wow. It's amazing. Boy. Honestly, if you are a first algorithmic listener, Welcome. I don't know how the heck you <laughs> we, we do have. Well, I don't Liam. I don't know if he's Albert. No, I've seen Liam's name. I don't know if we've messaged, but we've, I've definitely seen his name. Okay. Around Twitter. So he's, he's a, he was yeah. a follower of yours. I don't think anyone has found this podcast algorithmically. That's true. Yet, but we're yeah. working on it. The yeah. <laughs> and by the way, all of this, I th the, the tragic part is, is the algorithms can totally serve creatives in an amazing way. Like this goes back to the niche thing. Like what TikTok has done is actually allowed people to make all kinds of. We There's this guy American Baron who I found on the algorithm. On is TikTok. he the, the Woody? The Woody? Yeah, he's uh, Woody Allen yeah. mixed in a non-problematic way, mixed with a 25 year old today, and like, or Lizzie McAlpine who I put on my newsletter. Like, I found her just because she came up on the feed. Like, I'm not anti-algorithms, but it should be the hopefully the first phase. It's almost in like a they need to be a little bit bad or really good, and that's what you YouTube has a very bad algorithm. <laughs> And therefore, it's like we might you think we think you might like this. Like you like you you like cover acoustic covers totally. instead of being like you like acoustic covers. Oh yeah, have you ever thought about like buying a guitar? You want to buy a guitar? What if instead of buying a guitar, you saw Taylor Swift in the store buying guitars? Oh, it's Taylor Swift buying guitars. No, actually, she's with Seth Meyers on late night. And then like they just feed you the into rabbit like, holes. Yeah. But the 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 bad. But also part of the, one critical distinction is that YouTube and TikTok e or Reels, even from a UX standpoint. YouTube is, I'm looking at a sheet of thumbnails. What strikes my fancy? Huh. TikTok is next. Yeah. Next. And so I think that both makes tic YouTube's algorithms worse, but also I think YouTube's algorithm, if it is good at anything, it's get good at giving me a basket of choices. What it seems is, as a society, our relationship to technology and these platforms is moving us closer and closer to the extreme. Correct. And, and most people don't give a shit that that's where we're going. Or they haven't even noticed. Yeah. And that's really the essence of what this discussion is. And ultimately, the challenging part is to move closer to the, 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 the manual end of the spectrum takes energy, effort, and work 
that I think pays off in the end, but it's sort of also like reading a book or watching a movie versus scrolling TikTok. It's, 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 hot, it's not as low hanging fruit. Right. It comes down to instant gratification, right? The reason I spend my, so much time doom scrolling and less time reading books, even though I'm always happier when I read a book or even watch a film or listen to a full album is because I'm looking for the cheap thrill. And the algorithms reward the middle of the road, cheap thrill, instant dopamine, next reel. I can share the reel and get it. And I'm staying in the loop. But it's really hard to alone in your own home. Stop doom scrolling. Put your phone down. Go sit on the couch and read a novel. Of People fun. haven't discovered how fun it is to tell someone you did that, though. This is what... <laughs> to tell someone, sorry, I just checked my phone. I've been reading all morning. Or even to tell, I mean, clearly, tell yourself. everyone who spends any time with me digitally, via text, or in person has realized that I love to tell you about the things I've been consuming. But this is why, this is the essence of the whole taste versus algorithm thing. It is so wonderful and lovely, one, to spend time on a thing that wasn't just served to you and that you found. Yes. And th th there's this. Like, there's a pride in it, and, and it's it, it borders on the pretension, but it is totally a thing of pride. There's two pieces to it there's the external piece, which is it's so wonderful to share something great with somebody, but also they get at this, and that to keep calling it back to Kyle, there's this Montesquieu quote where he, he talks about like relating to taste almost be this set of rules that you didn't know existed, mm -hmm. where you realize it's almost to be seen. When you read something that, it, like, this isn't for everyone, but it's for me. I read this, like, this Harper's uh, Magazine thing about weightlifting this morning. It's like 6,000 words. And it was beautiful. And it's like, hmm. it's cool that the, that that is out there. And I found that. And I was so excited to share it. And and it sucks that people, some people don't understand the beauty and the appeal of that. I quoted this um, book I've only read part of speaking of talking about things you haven't finished this philosopher byung chul han has this brief section in, in his book non things that i think represents so much of what we've been discussing he says what counts is the short-term effect effectiveness replaces truth anything time consuming is on the way out lingering is another time consuming practice perception that latches on to information does not have a lasting and slow gaze Information makes her short-sighted and short of breath. It is not possible to linger on information. Lingering on things in contemplation, intentionless seeing, which would be a formula for happiness, gives way instead to the hunt for information. We have no ability. All of these things have to do with time, right? It's like the 6,000 word weightlifting article isn't quick and immediately fun when, and exciting. When is this quote from? When? Yeah. He wrote the book, I think, in 2018. Okay, so it's a modern, modern, yeah, yeah, yeah. modern philosopher. But yeah. but it totally ties into all kinds of Baudrillard and other uh, yeah. uh, like McLuhan. So I don't think this stuff is new. It's a wave, but that's the I think a recurring theme in so many of even the stuff we discussed last week. Like we're in this sort of battle with the the hyper reality of the internet, relating to how much time we're able to give to things, and taste, curation. The anti-algorithmic algorithmic stuff is in some way a desire to sort of like slow down, slow down, slow down and linger. I mean, that's the premise of O Fire, my music sharing community yeah. on Discord, which stole words from Kyle, actually, which is uh, non-algorithmic discovery. Like, I mean, there is thing. Someone was like, well, what if I found the song on my Discover Weekly? I'm like, and then you chose to share it with me. Thank you. Like I don't, I mean, I don't care how you got to it, but like the, once once you abstract it one layer out, like it's no longer. By the, the way, this stuff is that's what I. Oh man, I love. I was emailing with a guy who uh, who writes this newsletter um, recently, and he had observed how it was talking about the Chris Nolan like the Peloton thing, yeah, right. and how there were a bunch of crit, it, there was some quote from Chris Nolan about how grateful he was for critics, mm -hmm. and we 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 saw the the boy and the heron together. I saw it twice. In between the two viewings, I, watched, I read this um, review from David Ehrlich, and it changed my relationship with the movie. And I think like more so than even two viewings, the most significant individual bit of time I spent that changed my view on that film was that review. And I was struggling with this. I was talking with somebody recently. I'm like, how do I relate to this? Yeah, like, yeah. If I like a movie more because of a review I read, and I, what I've come to is that I think None of this is in a vacuum. All of it is the context. Totally. 
my friend Joe took me to see Klein Blue at MoMA, and I, it, I haven't had that many memorable experiences in a museum. That was certainly one of them. I thought about it a lot. I painted a thing on my coffee table the other day, or not the other day, a few months ago, Klein Blue. If is Klein Blue the color? Yeah, it's literally just a canvas. Of I've this color. seen. I know the canvas, but I didn't know the the that is the yeah. It's Eve's Klein. Um, okay. If Joe didn't show it to me, I almost certainly wouldn't have the same relationship with that color. How do I separate those two? The point is, I don't. Yeah. And similarly, I mean, that's sort of the premise of modern art, or, or like it's spe- especially the like hmm. you know pop art. But but that's why I'm so desperate to not desperate, but I I so love to share and be shared with. Algorithms should be an awesome tool that help us do more of the manual stuff. I, mm-hmm. think. I think that's the hope. And the alternative is we only land in Wally World. We're all in our little pods, consuming like crazy, never lingering on any of them, and certainly having no communal it, relationship. That's with definitely them. an intention of mine for this year is to let some let things breathe. And including and letting them breathe is like reflecting on them both with myself like to have for my own opinions about things but also to be influenced by other people who who have more context like how am i expected to see a movie a miyazaki movie of whom i've seen one or two of his other movies and to like fully get it and then to be upset and i, and I get that like you read a review and you're like oh this changed my opinion of it like what am i not i don't i'm not capable of forming my own opinions like i need i need someone to like handhold and and show me what i'm supposed to think about it it's like no they're Ideally, you can read stuff that you're like, no, actually, that that didn't help me appreciate it more, and other stuff that does. And and the thing that David's review does really well is like provides both color and context, and also like makes it more beautiful. Somebody else helping making something bigger is awesome. They they had this line in that podcast with Ezra where they talk about how artists have stopped even giving us the opportunity to have ambiguity or to have to dig deeper in art which is how they used to do it. It used to be very common for something to be not obvious what it is about. And you think about a Marvel movie. A Marvel movie is like, here's how you should feel. And we are going to perfectly design, or like Blackpink in the music context. We are going to, and I respect it. I think, I don't even, I think it's fine to love or even enjoy, but it is like, this is how you are going to feel at every minute of the thing. We are gonna take you on this perfectly manicured, manicured journey. And there's also value in art that is not obvious and that you even have to maybe sit. Remember when you would go see a movie? I remember seeing maybe like Inception the first time. Granted, I was 15 or 13. I don't know. But like 15. we talked for three hours after and we are all trying to make sense of it. Like that is. I remember actually he has an amazing quote after where they asked him, uh, does the top, is the top going to spin? You don't remember how it ends. Is the yeah. top going to fall over? And he's like, there's not an answer. I don't have it. There's a, there's not like a the scene doesn't end and then I removed that part. That is the end. Yes. There is Yes. Yes. But do you want to talk about the um Vision Pro and the party you hosted? We talked about it a bit on the last podcast, but Joe and I threw a pre-order party for the Vision Pro in New York 7 to 9 a.m. on Friday. It was very fun. We had a few people show up. Um and how, everyone how there How many? 20? Joe actually su- supposed A few and you you had 20 people? That's one th- one thousandth of our audience (laughs) we joe supposed that it was the largest independent vision pro pre-order party in the world i think that's probably right i'm sure there were bigger groups at like facebook or something but independently um no you're not allowed to access the apple website at facebook (laughs) (laughs) oh gosh i saw it yeah um everyone there got it coming although i was supposed to have 8 a.m on soho the day it came out to, to go pick it up in my Payment wouldn't go through, so I had to do delivery. And now Apple's pushed it to February 6th. Four days? Four days. So I'm quite pissed. That said, we're building a movement. We're entering um, the era of spatial computing here in New York. So we're really excited about that. You can't even start the order process unless you grab an iPhone or iPad with a Face ID. There's an amazing video of everyone in the room at the pre-order party, including Joe with an iPod and a phone doing... (laughs) It was very funny. We are very excited for the Vision Pro. I think there will be a version of... I will commit to this. Granted, all of February, you're going to be gone. But I'm going to be with you for... for That's I'm going true. To be with but you and one of... Two other of your Vision Pro pre-order party mates. That's true. 
and you, I assume we'll be skiing with the Vision Pros on. So you, <laughs> they're they're regular ski, ski go- So you I- ski down the mountain, you get on the chairlift, and you watch like five minutes of TikTok. Chairlift, Vision Pro. What I was going to do is I was going to commit to a version of this where we're sitting here and I'm wearing the Vision Pro. But mm-hmm. now what I'm realizing is we might do, since Joe will have his with us, we could do an episode in the metaverse. What will and, and that will be cool just for that that that's the cool part like it's over right there's not having actually doing it will not you know what we should do is we'll do a yes five minute segment of the podcast recorded on an iphone 15 pro in spatial video so that the 1.5 ish of our 100 listeners who have vision pros can sit in the metaverse with us i I didn't know that you were going to say that you did yeah, he oh. said, "Do you know what we should do?" Oh. I said, "Yes," but I, I also, wasn't one hundred percent sure. But that was exactly what I thought you were going to say. Has any? And I know you're going to say. Has next. any of your views changed about? You don't know what I'm going to say next. Have any of your views changed about the Vision Pro since we talked about it last? No. Are you excited to try it? Yes, but I was excited <laughs> to try it before. <laughs> I just I'm not thinking about it. So. Okay, I'm, I'm excited for the the sports thing, if that's well done. Apparently, the sports thing is the best thing. I'm ex- I'm excited Basketball. for that. I'm excited to watch a movie. Although I, it's really hard to imagine not not it not hurting by the end, like my eyes not burning. Apparently, it's really heavy. MKBHD said it's extremely. I've heavy. been doing my neck exercises. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, let's just do a little outro. Yeah. This is a cold close. So we're doing a cold, it's like a cold open. I could just leave. Yeah. I'm eating friend of the pod, a fellow newsletter writer. Friend of the pod. Friend, Totally a friend of the pod. And honestly. You said we were going to read all the feedback. Do we want to just run through some? And Oh, sh- you said comment, YouTube comments, of which there are probably none. Well, what I didn't anticipate is that we would, we literally put the last episode out yesterday. We, by we, I mean me. I spent way too long editing it. So if you want to edit our podcast for free, um, Wow, you got that. You have budget. You have. Oh, I'm spending. Yeah, if I could, if you can figure out how to get, have me not pay Adobe, I'll pay you the remaining twenty dollars. Um, we're up to ninety views. Um, let's see, real quick, Liam Ho. I'm sorry, I'm pronouncing it. How probably twenty five for the next pod. What do you use to capture information from across the web when you're consuming content and storing for later? Keep up the bangers. Oh, good question. I use Matter. Um, basically, Matter is Matter and texting my friends in the middle of reading something. I use both of those, and then I've been experimenting with this new app, Covey, um, from Truman and Treas. It's available on Twitter, and it's sort of available sp- on Twitter. It's like Discord and Group Matter, but for any form of media. Okay. So it's got a little bit of room to go, and they've got some cool AI features. I will probably stick with Matter for text and podcast, but for anything else, I think it's exciting. Mark GmbH two. So they're ditching Letterbox to focus on the movie, but then turn their podcast into a tweets and comments reading. Talk about a plot twist. Excited for the next episode. That's about us? I think so. We ditched Letterboxd. He was talking about how we were um, not going to use Letterbox, or at least not do ratings on Letterbox during the movie, so we could yes. be focused. But now, in our conversation, we're talking about just reading tweets and comments. Yes. It's a little bit... I'm sorry. John Exley Online, my guy, back and better than ever. <laughs> Keep in <laughs> mind, his last comment was a heater in the podcast theater. Yes. Uh, we also got a brief note from your boy who... He's meeting you like imminently. He's yes, outside yeah, the apartment. Yeah. Okay. He said, appreciated the notes on. F- oh, wait. This was a response to my newsletter. Yeah. But related. He, he told me, don't talk to the audience. That was the feedback I got on the podcast. It's weird. Miz said, you should act as though the audience is there. Like they're a third part of the conversation. But not address them, which is what we talked about at the beginning of the pod. He said, appreciate. Tajo said, appreciate the notes on Filter World and stoked to dig into it, but thrice more stoked on active interrupting Stellar Thumbnail. Wow. And honestly, I got very little robust feedback. I think people sent that to you. but Did you decidedly not ask for it? I put an Instagram story that said, send feedback, give us your feedback, send me the positive notes, send negative things to Andrew. Oh, that's what Ms. did. (laughs) Um, But... Like four people said they loved the name, which I came up with in all of five seconds. Amazing. I, I like the name too. I don't like the thumbnail. I, I love the, the still is amazing. The still, the, the best part is, 
it looks so like I'm yelling at you and you're so annoyed. I think the actual still was like you were distracted. You just kind of went like. I think was... I'm trying to remember Paul G- the Paul no, Giamatti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was ranting about In Praise of Shadows, which we cut out all of, and you were just totally in your own head thinking about Paul Giamatti and happened to go like this while I was like. <laughs> it was great find. <laughs> Amazing thumbnail. Uh, so, yeah, this is our cold exit, and um, I'm going to cut it off sometime. By the way, if anybody from the big tech heard us, love algorithms, give me the juice.